And he starts working with both of us around this. And he starts doing something what we call futuring. Without knowing it, he starts planning a future. This is something he's never done before. He starts going and taking a master's training program and preparing himself to teach music. He is now in a group as well. It is hard the group becomes his family. He cannot get effectively engaged. He is constantly being supportive to people, helpful to people, but he cannot open up in the group. And he says, the group is my family. I cannot be there. But in the meantime, his life is changing on the outside while it seems as pale as could be with me. And he is starting to progress professionally. He has now written a light opera about a woman who is dying of cancer. And she is, in a sense, he writes the melodies, the songs, the verse for this. I cannot uh, go into all the verses, but there's one I would like to read to you. It is the woman who is dying of cancer. And in this opera, she sings, please forgive me. And I'd like to read it to you because in it, uh, I believe he's not just asking the woman to forgive him or the woman asking forgiveness. He is also asking forgiveness as well. For there is a merger between the woman and himself. For sometimes, I think psychically, he has not left this dying woman. But in the writing of the opera, I think there is a leave taking. And one of the verse goes like this. Can you forgive me for needing to be alone just when you want me to hold you? Can you forgive me for not hearing you when you were asked if birds live in the sky? Can you forgive me? For being too tired to tuck you in at night, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Can you forgive me for being so bitter, I poisoned your games. Can you forgive me? For being so angry, I forgot how to laugh. Can you forgive me for crying each time I look in your eyes? Please forgive me. Please forgive me. He writes this in music. He writes many other verses, some called love songs. Others call forgiveness and death. If I were to die tomorrow, cancer, conflicting needs, something is wrong. And he's putting his life story in this opera, an operetta. He also goes on to write another one called Hiroshima, the disaster. In it, he plays for me the music. And somewhere through this metaphor, he is sharing the disaster of his life. It looks like very clearly he has made a decision that he wanted to live. Now, he has been in treatment a long time with me. And far from his dying, each time he takes the blood test, the white blood cell test holds its own or even gets a little better. He receives a job offer just lately. He graduates from college, graduate school, with a master's in composition. He now receives an art job or a music job in Paris. He decides to take it and go on with his life and to take the risks that even though he has some cancer, right now, his white blood count is better than ever. This man knows that we cannot cure his cancer, but he is doing everything he can to make life work for him. He wants to live. Life now has some meaning. He meets many men along the line. My relationship to him is part like a Dutch uncle provocative, confrontive, when he meets these young studs, 
that uh, become very involved with him in his life, and he draws them for me. I ask him, are you sure you are not wanting that power in yourself to define yourself? Are you giving up that power and trying to find it in others? Do you dare take that power in yourself? We go back and forth. Sometimes when I push him about his feelings, uh, he's furious at me. But uh, we go back and forth. I push, he looks sometimes at me meekly, sometimes he tries. And he calls my therapy consultation room the gloom room. For whenever he walks into the gloom room, he feels dead. He is, in a sense, full of despair. But this gloom room, this heavy black gloom room, starts changing for him. And I thought I'd share this case with you because last week was his last session with me after 12 years. And he is going on to Paris to live there and to teach music. Uh, and I'd like to share some of the issues that the art brings up and the music brings up. He is a better, he, is, he, uh, he makes much more contact, but his character structure is the same. But what the music did and what the art did was to get underneath the images and reach those images, make contact with those images, even though the outside seemed the same. And there seemed to be some meeting of the minds between the patient and myself. How much was insight? How much was the fact that he met my father and I met his father? He met his mother, he met a new mother. These mothers, these fathers started to meet and form a new synthesis. Was it insight that helped? Not in this case. Was there something inexplicable of two minds meeting? Perhaps. But what happened in meeting the grief, the pain, and the blackness was Somewhere, he and I had gone together through blackness, and in our blackness, there was some light. And that in the expiration of blackness, which comes through all kinds of pain of loss, and the problem is that often, if we cannot grieve, that blackness comes embedded and embedded in hopelessness that then becomes cut off from us. And all we are left sometimes with is numbness, the cold numbness of loss. And that it never permits mourning to go on. For this man, he had to go through blackness to find some light. And that the experience of treatment is that through all of it, there is a black spot for all of us that we have to enter into to regain that rhythm inside of us that becomes frozen in loss. And so part of his regaining a rhythm, not just in music, but in his life of regaining a power that defined life for him was touching however he could, loss, grief, and a decision whether he wanted to really live or die. Only after he was able to touch some of his pain around his mother and loss that he knew was there, could he make some decision that he really, did he really want to live? Did he want to die? He had to make that decision himself and it's not a conscious one. Somewhere you make it without knowing you make it. Just as well as sometimes you make a decision to die and you don't know you're making it. And this came up in his experiences as he started to change his whole attitude about going to school, developing a relationship with the man for the first time who he started to live with. And then, as it, you might predict, after nine months, it broke up. 
But this time he was able to experience loss with me after it broke up and go on. And what I became, as with many traumatic experiences in life, and this is not sexual trauma, but it is trauma nevertheless, is that he needed a witness. He needed a witness to say, yes, you have lost, you have been pained. I can see what you have gone through. I am there to hold that with you so that you can look at it, see it, feel it, and perhaps take leave of it. In many respects, that is what the therapy is. It is a leave-taking. It is a way of saying goodbye. Now, what you have before you is some, each one of you came in and uh, you were given some either charcoal, you were given, uh, either you have a black crayon, and I'd like to try <clears throat> something with you. I would like you to take a piece of anything that is black that looks comfortable for you. And I once again would like somebody who would like to come up here and work with me up here as well. Is anybody interested? much you can move into the state of blackness without controlling it and to see whether the state of blackness that has no control, that has no, no ordered meaning, can develop its own meaning. So this is what I would like to recommend you do. I would like you to let your hand move over the paper with the black so that the black becomes an extension of your body. So that as you're moving the black, you can feel it, you can almost taste it, you're part of it. And you let the black move wherever it may go without trying to force an image. And then as you move into it, so that it indeed becomes enveloping to you, so that you are completely in its formlessness. See whether out of this you may start finding, not imposing, but finding a form, a shape that arises out of the black as you move into its disorder and see if anything comes up that has a shape but let the shape speak to you rather than you shaping it. So please get into the black, let your hand move wherever it may want to with the black, let it move wherever it wants to in the paper, let it mess around, let your hands get dirty with the black, and then move it wherever it may go without trying to make it ordered, without trying to give it any shape, and then see out of this disorder whether a shape will arise. And when you see a shape arise, let shape it. At a certain point, there is a, a point where a shape comes and some of you may destroy the shape. So that there is a certain kind of a critical point where you allow something to come, grab it and shape it, and the point is, can you get into it enough for something to arise, and then when it does arise, can you grab it and give it form? So see what happens as you get into the black, and see how 
but you may try to shape it in any way you want. with the black. You can oppose something on it, you can blot it out, you can go and put some other color on it. It is up to you to kind of play with the black in any way you wish. <laughs> Sometimes we have to get into a black for quite some time before anything will emerge. And nothing may emerge today because it demands too much involvement in it. Some of you may not like the feeling of black in your hands. Some of you may enjoy the sensation. Some of you may have the feeling that the black may start smearing your clothing. <coughs> or as it gets under your fingernails. Demands getting into the mess of black. <laughs> now, because this is a artificial situation, you just may not have all the time you need to go through this, and so you may have to do this at your leisure at your home what we're trying to do here. So understand that we are trying to do something that has some real limits because of the workshop lecture situation. We're trying to finish up or to stop in a few minutes with the recognition that maybe something will not have emerged. Anybody ever hear of Ad Reinhardt? You have heard? Ad Reinhardt is noted for his studies in black. And he has had exhibit after exhibit in the study of blackness. And he has written some poetry around blackness. And I'd like to read to you his reflections of blackness. Black is negation. Ministers, priests, solemn token of absolute principles. Sure, inexorable, erudite philosophy, humbly aphorism, proverbs, adages, infinite, inevitable, complete, insoluble mystery, funeral, dislike of black, clinging to life, naivete, unconditional demands, black, morbidity, despair, blue carnal man regenerated, made spiritual, death, inevitability of fate, nothingness, negation, worldly, immutable, stark, worldly, wise, <coughs> regal, not pompous, universal, sober, dignified, not officious, patient, perseverance, true substance, weight, sophisticated, passivity, deliberation, introspection, not exciting, arbitrary if not artificial, private life different than public life, schizophrenic, mystery, not carefree, game, wit, cleverness, removed from the ordinary, conventionality, leave real personalities at home, evening clothes, assume a proper polite manner, mother pastel, father darker shades, concentration on self. These are the reflections of a painter who paints only in black. And his work is often on exhibit. Some of you may also find that he has a, also a book on reflections on black. In many respects, what we're going to do here today is talk a little bit about, at the concluding part of this, what your reflections and thoughts are.
So once again, what I'd like you to do is with your partner, share a little bit some of your associations and connections and what you discovered feeling-wise as well as associations as you looked into the black. What did you see as you saw blackness? Please just take around a few minutes to talk to your partner about your piece of blackness. Go ahead.